Hello, everyone. I'm just going to leave my screen up so I can admit the last few people as we're talking. Um, my name is Judith. I'm the museum manager. You will see me in a minute. Uh, welcome to the Devil's Porridge Museum talk for this evening. Uh, tonight, we're going to be hearing all about the writings of Moss Van Farewell magazine, which is a fantastic uh, document in the museum archive created at the end of World War I by the staff at HM Factory Gretna the greatest munitions factory on earth in World War One, and the Devil's Porridge Museum exists so mainly to, say, to share its story, although we do have lots of other displays. We just reopened to the public today after a long period of the closure, so we're delighted that we're up and running again, and we're still going with these online talks too. So just a couple of little housekeeping issues. Um, first of all, you should be muted, uh, and you will stay muted until um, Kirsty has finished her talk. Uh, and we will at the end have a time for questions. If during the, the talk you have any thoughts or any questions, please do feel free to put them in the chat um, or the comments section. Um, Kirsty said that she's very happy to sort of stop and talk uh, midway and have a very sort of informal evening. Um, so do feel free to pop your thoughts down there and ask anything that you'd like to. The um, the tonight's talk is being recorded uh, and it will be shared on the museum's uh, YouTube channel uh, with the permission of Kirsty. Uh, if anyone doesn't want to take part in that or doesn't want to be seen on screen, then please just um, turn your video off. It's very unlikely that you will be, um, but if you uh, don't want to be seen at all, just please turn your video off. Um, and you can see all the different talks and events that we've got coming up. So we've got one each month, a free evening talk like this one. I think we've got them planned until about October, although we've got a couple more in the pipeline. So we should have a full ro roster for the whole year. Uh, once a month, a free talk and a really fascinating historical topic um, where you can have a great discussion with other people. And we've got our two, co two day conference on May 20th and 21st, which is on the theme of women in wartime. We've got six different panels. Um, and 24 speakers um, talking about uh, issues as diverse as uh, women working in industry, women in the armed forces or in the front line, uh, women in health, uh, and all sorts of other things, uh, women in leisure during the wars, uh, and uh, women on the railways, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a really should be a really great program. So if you're interested in that, please do get your ticket as soon as possible. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, Kirsty uh, to this evening. I think we've got everybody in and we're about three minutes past. So hopefully everybody's here who wants to be, but I'm sure Kirsty can admit them. Uh, if not, I see one message in the chat. Let me just have a quick look. Oh yes, the Great War Huts, that will be a great talk. I'm sure that will be. So thank you very much. So if you want to know anything about Great War uniforms, the Great War Huts should be a great uh, talk. I'm sure it will be. Uh, so, uh, hello, there I am, there's my face. Nice to see you all. Uh, and I'm going to pass the, the hosting over to Kirsty, who's going to deliver for what I'm sure will be a really interesting talk. Oh, someone's entered the mic and waiting me. A really interesting talk on Moss Van Farewell magazine. I'm sure I'm looking forward to it very much. So, I'm going to pass over the hosting to you, Kirsty. Here we go. Wait. Let's see if this works. Let's see if this uh, works. There we are. Oh, wait, it's saying. Who's disabled screen sharing? Uh huh. It's not working. Just having a think about it. Slideshow. Start. Can you all see that? Uh, I'm just seeing a black screen at the moment, unfortunately. Can other, can other people shake their heads or nod their heads if they can see it? No, I'm seeing lots of shaking heads, unfortunately, oh, Kirsty. Um, Nothing yet, there's someone in the chat. Let's have a look. Can you see that there? You can see my screen. You just can't see the slideshow. Why would that be? Yeah, we just say you were viewing Kirsty Blair's screen, but that's it. Okay, slide. It should be playing. Well, we'll just go back to you sharing if I can't get it up. Um, yeah, sure. You're not seeing that? No, unfortunately not. It did seem like it was working when we tried it earlier, but. Yeah, it definitely was, but not to worry. Yeah. Um, you can just put yours up again. So um, I'll reclaim host and. Reclaim uh, host. That no problem. Yeah, that's right. Okay, here we go. Quickly, go back to screen share. There we are. Here we go. Okay. So, Brilliant. Yeah, 
if anyone can just put in the comments if they can't see that would be very helpful but you you can see it Kirsty. i can see it fine yes yeah, so just yeah, flick forward yeah. i'll just have to use you as a research assistant judith and tell you when to switch no problem. I'm very happy to that. <laughs> okay so um it's a pleasure to be here and first of all congratulations to the museum on its reopening um, I'm sure everyone here is looking forward to getting um, back into the museum and all the other museums in Scotland. Um, I certainly am. Um, can you flick over to the next slide, Judith? And I'll just give you a bit of context for what I've been looking at. Um, okay, so um, I'm here because I'm running a large scale project, it's actually a government funded research project, Piston Pen and Press, that's about industrial workers and their engagement with literary culture. So the project is concerned with what happens when you get a lot of people together in the new industrial workplaces of the Victorian period and into um, the early 20th century and the way in which people start getting involved in writing about their work, the way in which reading rooms and libraries are established through workplaces and in local towns, um, and the ways in which people start forming associations and participating in different kinds of culture, um, like amateur theatrical associations, literary clubs, debating societies, mutual improvement societies, and so forth. And the point is really that it's through these literary, in a wide sense, engagements that we can often recover what workers themselves said about their work um, in ways that certainly for um, the bulk of the Victorian period, we can't otherwise do because when oral historians started their work in the 1960s or thereabouts, um, these people were not alive for their memories to be recorded. So I do in general work on the period before the First World War, I should admit. Um, I have to say when I was researching this talk, um, it took me half an hour of staring blankly at the newspaper database to realize that the reason why I wasn't seeing all this information I'd expect to see was because it was the First World War and it was censored and therefore it wasn't there. Um, so I'm, I'm mostly a Victorianist. If I say something very ignorant about World War One, I'm sure Judith can jump in or the rest of you and keep me right. Um, the other things we do in this project, incidentally, if you think it sounds interesting, is we run an online reading group looking at working class writings. Um, and we run three free online courses on future learn, um, working lives in the railways, running now with the Railway Museum, um, working lives in the coal mines starting in two weeks. Um, that's with all three mining museums in Scotland, England and Wales and working lives in the factories and mills. Um, so Devil's Porridge is um, an outlier in the project as well because mostly we're looking at textile workers, railway workers and miners, but all industrial workers can feature. Um, so I was giving a talk in this project last uh, two springs ago at the Mitchell Library. And um, someone came up to me afterwards and said, do you know the, the munitions workers in Gretna all wrote poems? And I said, no, actually, I didn't know that at all. Um, and she, um, this was um, Marjorie Munro said, well, I'll, I'll post you the booklet that I have. And she did, which was fantastic. She posted me Sheila Ruddick's little anthology called Munition Workers Poems. Um, and when I read this, I was very excited. Um, but by this point, um, I guess actually it was last spring I gave this talk because by this point we had entered lockdown and I was desperate to see the original copies of these munition workers poems and I couldn't get to them. Um, so in August last year I did make it to the British Library's outpost, Boston Spa outside York, um, to see the Moss Band Farewell magazine. But sadly, although I'll mention it here, I have not seen in person um, the Dornick Souvenir magazine, which is the other one produced um, from the same factory. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? I lose my track. Okay, so we're very interested in my project in company magazines because they always contained a lot of workers' writings. But these are interesting because they're very highly mediated sources. That is, they're almost always sponsored by the company itself. So obviously they tend to represent a very uh, positive image of that company and what it's like to work for it. Um, and in the long 19th century, 
Um, the industry that really goes in for these magazines is the railways. Every railway company has a staff magazine. Um, and these are actually a way to get noticed and to move up through the ranks. So there are a couple of famous examples of young clerks who started out writing for and editing for one of these magazines and then rose up um, to become a director of the company, like uh, his name, Sam Fay. Um, so magazines are designed to foster the idea um, that the workers are like a family and a community, that they're all in this together and that they've got pride in their job and in their employers. Um, the employers use these magazines to promote particular workplace cultures um, and to kind of advocate for their ideals. But because these magazines can be seen by the outside world as well, they've often got a dual audience. They're for the workers, but obviously the workers are taking them away. They're sharing them with their family. They're posting them overseas to their immigrant relatives um, and so forth. And some are actually being sold locally. They're also representing the company to the outside world. And part of that is showing the outside world that your workers, especially if these are um, industrial workers who may not have had much formal education, that your workers are smart, that they are educated, intelligent people. And a magazine is a great way to do that because the workers themselves will send in um, usually poems. Workers tend to write poems because poetry is short um, and a lot easier to get published than your novel or your 300 page autobiography. So people will send in poems or short stories or prose pieces about my life in the railways. Um, and those will be published and those will be a good advert um, for the kind of workers in that company. Okay, I think next slide. Problem with not seeing the slides myself, they're all mystery to me till we get to them. Um, in the Victorian period, what's frustrating is that other than the railway archives, um, not many workplace magazines survive. So we'll often see references. This is especially true of the textile factories. We'll see references to the fact that there was some kind of magazine, but the magazine hasn't really made it into the archives um, because it wasn't considered an essential part of the business archives often. A recent interesting exception though it dates from the 20th century is the Ashington Collieries magazine. Um, that's in Northumberland archives, which is, if you've been over there, it's in the spectacular building with the Woodhorn Mining Museum. Um, amazing place, great archives, great museum, nice cafe, highly recommend. Um, Ashington Collieries magazine is a good example of what I'm talking about because it's sponsored by the management. Um, you can kind of see that and you can see that the editorial in this early on is called Progress, so a typical improving topic. Um, it does contain workers' writings and it also contains cartoons um, by some of the miners. So in the cartoon on the right, um, a miner is pretending to his girl that he's an engineer at the colliery and the picture on the right is him engineering. So he's actually um, on shift pushing the tubs of coal. So I'll, I've managed to trace quite a few of the writers in the Ashton Colliery's magazine and they were all um, local miners, some of them quite young, teenage miners, so they did contribute um, and their contributions might or might not have been a way to get themselves recognized and acknowledged by management. But in general, it's a, it's a polite improving magazine. Um, next slide, please. However, one of the more interesting aspects of these company magazines is that alongside the official magazines, we know that there were lots of unofficial magazines and these really didn't survive because they often weren't even printed. They were manuscript magazines and because they were sort of illicit because this is where you said what you really thought um, about the company and about the management. Um, so my favorite that my colleague in the project, Dr. Oliver Betts, researcher at the Railway Museum has worked on is called the Engineorum. Um, so you saw the um, GWR official magazine. This is like their unofficial scrapbook. So on the left, I don't know if you can see this, but you can see um, somebody's out drinking and they get wheeled back in a wheelbarrow saying GWR. So that is the, this is kind of a group of young clerks in the office. 
and that's their version of the official railway outing, which is reported as, you know, extremely respectable in the official magazine. And actually everybody was getting carted home in wheelbarrows because they drunk so much. Um, and on the right is a lovely photo from 1902 called Willie and his disciples. Um, so Willie, we think is the head clerk in the office. You can see that I think some of those moustaches are fake moustaches, make fun of Willie's moustache and they have, we all love our dear old Willie a sign. So this is just a group of workers um, kind of um, carrying on and having fun. And the scrapbook is full of uh, parody and satire and humor and in jokes that only this particular group of staff would get. So this existed all over the place, um, but it's just one of those frustrating losses to the archives. If you've got one of these belonging to your grandparents, great grandparents under the bed, please unearth it and uh, share it. Um, next slide, please. Oh, there's a little question. Do the scrapbooks contain many names? Well, that's another thing um, that's interesting because no, um, I know that Ollie's tried to um, trace some of the clerks in the engine room, but it's difficult because they're all referring to each other by their nicknames or their first names or by comic pseudonyms. And of course, in the instances that I've, that haven't survived, but where I find references to something that did once survive, that was a satirical magazine, you're not gonna sign your name to a satirical piece about the management because the management are gonna find your manuscript lying about um, and you're gonna be in trouble. So that's another, another issue. I'll show you in a minute, a couple of people I've traced in um, the um, Devil's Porridge magazines. So in all these workplace magazines, the closest one to the ones I'm looking at, which I'm sure some of you will know about, is the bombshell produced in Templeborough in Sheffield because it's also a munition workers magazine. And this, um, in this case, there was a rival magazine and it was produced by the, the shop committee. Um, so it's got a trade union focused. It's much more worker oriented, the Firth Worker. Um, if you're interested in this, I can drop in the chat the name of um, someone, Mark Sheridan, who did a master's thesis on this magazine, um, which I would love to see. It's in the Imperial War Museum archives, I think, or the Sheffield archives, or both. Um, but obviously I haven't got to see it yet. But um, Mark Sheridan's thesis is very good. Um, I had a quick look at it and highly recommend if you want to learn about this magazine. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so the one I'm looking at primarily is this one. Um, the Moss Band Farewell Magazine, 1916 um, to 1919. So this is an interesting artifact and it's interesting because it's really a cross between a magazine like the company magazines I'm talking about and uh, a, commemorative, a commemorative booklet, like the kind of thing you'd have for a special occasion. Because where it says 1916 to 19, I think, what it's meaning is this is the lifespan of the factory. So this is a this is the this is a farewell. This is like a a school yearbook now would probably be the best comparison. It's remembering a period of everybody's lives when they were in the same place doing the same thing. So unlike most magazines, I don't think this was necessarily issued in parts. But I don't know if. Um, Judith will know more about this that she can say at the end or I'll find out more if I do more research in the archives um, because in a way it would have been surprising if there wasn't a magazine that was also circulating but I can't tell from this artifact whether the pieces in it had been published somewhere else and are then gathered together in 1919 or whether they're all collected here. The editorial says they received contributions of first class quality, a backing which enabled us to go for a thousand copy issue um, quite a lot, though not necessarily a lot relative to the number of people who've worked um, in this location. Such is the intense patriotism of Gretnaites for Gretna, the happy family for its erstwhile home. And here you see that language of family and home and dedication to the workplace itself. Not patriotism to the cause in the war, but patriotism to Gretna, the attachment to the location. Next slide, please. Um, so this is again very much management sponsored. It's got um, a photo, large photo of important um, 
people opening the page. It's got a list of all the supervisors, but no list of the people I want to know about who are um, the workers um, on the factory floor, but it gives, it gives their addresses as well, um, whether that's so that they could keep in touch or whether it's to just show the different locations that people have come from to work in Gretna, I'm not sure. Um, but everything in this magazine is very, very respectable. Those are the kind of lady supervisors and the photo on the right. And the respectability to a certain extent extends the contributions, though I'll look at a few that um, walk that line between celebrating the factory and being slightly satirical about working for it. Um, next slide. Yeah, so it's standard for every editor um, throughout the long 19th century and into the 20th century. If you're creating a magazine um, or you're a newspaper editor, you always say that you received 20 times as many contributions as you could possibly have published. Whether this is true or not um, is impossible to discern, but the editor claims um, that photographs, sketches, prose and poetry have kept flowing in in a never ending stream and that much material has been rejected and that the magazine has actually been designed so that it would, so that it would have contributions from different kinds of worker. So it's not necessarily a selection based on quality, it's a selection based on representation. Um, the largest um, kind of genre represented is poetry. Um, and again, as I say, that's really not surprising. Everybody was educated to be able to write um, standard kinds of verse in this period. And poetry was considered the most respectable literary genre. So if you wanted to show off, you wanted to be able to write a poem. Um, so there's this little slightly satirical note that the amount of poetry which has emanated from certain quarters has been tremendous and leads us to believe that the Lake School, Wordsworth et al, have revisited us in spirit. Um, the Fair Belinda once more came in for a great deal of unnecessary attention. Um, so that's saying that they received an awful lot of love poems about the female workers, not all of which went in. The wages department paid out cash in iambic swing. The spirit of Longfellow decided at the last minute to join with the Lake School and used as his mouthpiece such an ordinarily staid person as an engineer. I won't go into it here, but I am interested in literary influences and the two biggest um, influences on the poetry in this volume are Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, not surprising, he's got enormous international popularity even many years after his death. And I think also Rudyard Kipling, um, who was perhaps the most popular English poet um, of this period and whose verses were very, very well known. Next slide, please. There's a particular attention to comradeship and a special attention to women's rule um, in the factory, in the magazine, um, and to the notion that women have been brought together from all across the countryside to work in harmony here. The women of England who have done so well during the war have nowhere earned their laurels more deservedly than at Gretna. Um, and they're all one large family. And Sector Manager W.G. Emmett says, we are a united family, free from jealousies, all striving for the same end. The measure of success which has been achieved must in large part be due to the spirit of comradeship which has permeated the factory. Obviously statements which should be taken with a pinch of salt. Um, actually one of the more interesting things you can find um, about workers at Gretna in the newspaper records is all the criminal cases against them for stealing and drunkenness because those were reported um, regularly in the uh, Carlisle and Dumfries papers. Um, so there's a certain sense in which claims like this in a magazine that again is both for the staff and for the outward world um, are trying to create um, a, a very positive sense of community in um, a group of people who had not always unreservedly been welcomed by the locals. Um, incidentally, the, that's one of the title covers on the right, which I think might be meant to say farewell moss band, but I cannot decipher how the bottom squiggles are meant to be moss band or Isn't any other, <laughs> any other word. You can have a look at it for a minute and see. Um, next slide, please, Judith. 
I thought that was magazine, personally. I think it says magazine. Yeah, no, you Farewell might be right. magazine. Yeah. It is very squiggly, though, isn't it? Farewell yeah, magazine. Looking, looking at it, I was just thinking whether or not, because cordite was so named because, or uh, legend has it, because it resembles cord or rope. And I wonder if that's what it's trying to be, rope, that it's cord, cord, cordite, that it's in the oh, shape Oh, that's of. a great point. Yeah, that it might be, yeah. yeah. I've never actually looked at it very carefully. I've now got lots of questions about it. So it's I know, it's a really beautiful but... image. I have to say you're probably better is, at all, yeah, with answering the... questions. I want to know yeah. why why he's holding slippers in it. Yes, <laughs> yeah. And I was wondering if they're supposed to be identifiable individuals um, because they look quite characteristic, don't they? Uh, the, the three in the middle. And then looking at the symbols, obviously you've got the Canadian leaf on the right-hand side. Mm. Um, and then obviously there's some other ones that I'd like to try and discern as well. So that, it's quite, yeah, you've got me, got me thinking now. Thank you very there, much. There you go. You can do, you can do a talk on this image next. Yeah, yeah. You could, there's just, lots yeah, to unpack in it. Yeah. And it, <laughs> it looks like sort of like a press that they're standing in as well, almost in the middle. I don't know yeah, what that was, might be. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you very much for making me actually dwell on it for a change. <laughs> Thank you. Next slide. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, for this talk, as well as for the Piss and Pen and Press project, and I should say we're creating a big database for that project, so any industrial workers who wrote anything can go in our database. So I did have a look at all the names that feature in the Dornick Souvenir and Moss Band Farewell, with a special attention to the women, because I really want to find more women writers for our database. So this is back to the question about names. Some of these poems are signed with initials, some of them aren't signed, and some of them are signed with full names. But of course, as any of you who've done family history research know, um, a lot depends on the rarity or otherwise of the name. Um, and until a 1921 census is released, it's gonna be hard um, to find some of these people. Um, however, I did have some um, surprising success and the two I'm most interested in are Susan M. Ferguson um, and Elizabeth Eastall, who's on the next slide. So Susan M. Ferguson was a poet. She was a newspaper poet. This is true of everybody I work on because I find her under her name. This is actually really unusual. Thank you, Susan Ferguson, for not choosing a pseudonym I'd never find. I find her publishing several poems in the Aberdeen Press and Journal, all on what I call very standard themes that is love poems, poems about springtime, published in March, that kind of thing. And then I find her in the census. And she's a really interesting early 20th century woman because she was a crofter's daughter. So it comes in quite a traditional rural um, profession who had a job at at least one point in 1901 as a telegraph clerk. Um, so I'm fairly sure this is her because she had experience that could have been relevant. But in 1911, you know, between 1911 and 1919 then she went from being a crofter's daughter working on the croft in Methlick, um, it's a small town in Aberdeenshire, to working in a munitions factory. Um, so she's one of ours in the project, she's an industrial worker and she's a poet. Um, she wrote a couple of um, the kind of poetry, the kind of poems that are very, very common in the magazine, which are these celebratory, we'll work very, very hard for peace and victory. Um, what I like in this poem, Bravo Gretna, is we'll toil like any navvy squad, which is um, quite a specific image of how hard um, the women are labouring. Um, and an image of um, manual, very specific manual labour, so not typing or telegraph clerking, but working as hard as an avi. Next slide. So this is the other um, woman I managed to find. Um, and I'm, di I'm dithering, you can give me your opinion about whether she can go into the database or not, because I find her kind of by default. Um, there are 10 people with this name, but I don't think that nine of them are plausible because um, they were married, which means they were unlikely to move up to Gretna and leave their family, or they seem quite elderly to be herring off to Scotland to work in a munitions factory, or they were children. So I would really like this poet to be the Elizabeth Eastall who was a weaver in a cotton mill, because then she's doubly one of mine. She works in a munitions factory, um, and she can join the many, many um, cotton, Lancashire cotton factory poets 
that we have located. Um, sadly, her one poem, Farewell Cordite, is not terrifically exciting, um, but nonetheless, she wrote a poem, she's going in the database. Um, and it's an interesting poem in that it does talk about um, how everybody has come together um, from across Britain or indeed the world, and now they're all sailing off um, at the end of the war. There's a huge amount of nostalgia, of course, in this magazine because it's a farewell magazine um, and because this community is being broken up at the end of the war with some controversy, as you probably know, over what was going to happen to the factory and to the buildings. Um, next slide. Yeah, and the only other woman I managed to find was Madeline Ida Bedford. Um, so I put her in to show you that um, they're not all working women who publish here. She was living on private means in the 1911 census, so she was probably relatively well off. And actually, um, I could have told you from this poem that I wasn't going to find a working class woman because it's written in the voice of a working class woman, but very implausibly. And it presents quite a negative image um, of the factory floor munitions girls because it's all about this common perception that they were being paid extremely high wages and they were spending them all on um, smart clothes, trinkets and going out dancing and drinking with men. Years back I wore tatters, now I silk stockings, my friend. Um, I've braces and jewellery, rings envied by friends, a sergeant to swank with and something to lend. So it's a comic poem, but it's actually representing a stereotype that occurs in quite a lot of middle class writing about um, the working class woman in the factory, um, munition wages. But it's interesting because it also shows the kind of women who are publishing in these magazines and their very different backgrounds, but how they're being juxtaposed in these pages. Next slide, please. Okay, there's a lot of poetry that's very, very, again, standard and typical, like this, My Munition Girl. Um, I have so many poems called My Factory Girl, My Handsome Parloon Weaver, um, and so forth. And pretty much you can substitute the profession of the woman into any of the poems. Um, because when you get to verses like, Ah, this world's cares and crosses, I miss cheerfully would bide, I'd gladly throw life's losses with my lassie at my side. That could go into any Scottish poem published at any time since about 1790, um, and it would be a verse in keeping. So what you're doing that's unusual is you're putting in the words munition worker and you're actually um, reshaping a very standard romantic poem um, to be about this new um, and immediate industrial profession. Oh, I see I've got a great typo there where I put in ladies at the front instead of laddies at the front. Um, it must have been a, a, a Freudian slip. It was not, in fact, talking about um, the ladies. Um, these poems, all these My Girl Who Works in the Factory poems, are a way of rewriting factory girls as respectable romantic heroines um, because um, there was so much controversy over working women running, of course, right into and through the First World War um, and about the morals of women who worked in factories and whether they were suitable objects for um, romance and courtship and would make good wives or not. And you can see that this poem, which was gathered by Sheila Ruddick, um, was actually published in a local paper, the Annandale Observer. Unfortunately not digitized, so I haven't been able to look at it yet. Um, but I will, um, when I can find it or get to it, um, see if there are many other munitions poems in that local paper, because that's a really interesting way of um, the factory representing itself to the locals. Um, next slide, please. One of the other things that the Dornick Souvenir and Mossman Farewell do um, with these factory girl poems and with other poems is they're really um, playing on the distinction between how certain classes of worker are perceived and how they perceive themselves. They are trying to make munition work in all its different grades respectable. And this is nowhere more obvious than in the Gretna Navi's Dream, which interestingly is also the only poem I could find. So I searched, I, I ran a search on all the people and then I ran a newspaper database search on all the poem titles, because that's a, a better way to track where a poem is going. And I find it in the Sporting Chronicle, rather oddly. However, what that means, I can tell you as a researcher of newspaper poetry is that the Sporting Chronicle almost certainly got it from somewhere else first. 
It's just that that somewhere else is not currently digitized um, on the British newspaper archive. So I think this poem probably circulated around um, different newspapers. That would be absolutely typical, um, which means that um, at least some of the poems in the Dornick Souvenir and then probably in the Mossman Farewell did appear elsewhere before they got into the magazine, which is interesting in terms of circulation and audience. And this is a great poem because it's about a Navi fantasizing that he was treated well um, by the locals. Whenever he took a tram ride through the town, ladies jumped up to let him sit down. Sidesmen and church's ministers too pressed him to take the very best pew. Um, the police guide his feet. I must be in heaven, he thought. Um, this can't be the faddest utopia Carlisle where the pubs close on Sundays and cinemas bright or forbidden to give the people delight. There is a huge controversy about Sundays um, and what happened on them going on in the local press, specifically in relation to the workers in the munitions factory and the 15,000 navvies when they were there building the factory um, because they were said to be rioting drunken, drunkenly through the streets. They need to close all the pubs. Um, stop selling alcohol, remove all possible ent entertainment other than the church, which is where they should be on Sundays. So Navis had a terrible reputation. The local papers are full of not very restrained anxiety about them. Um, and this poem is actually giving us the Navis perspective in which he is um, wishing that people treated him better. Um, now I've lost the slides. Judith, do you want to Oh, sorry, I was just making sure there wasn't anyone who'd been uh, waiting to join us because that did happen the other day. And I was just um, checking comments. That's Thank a good um, comment. Yeah. Post office records. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. I shall look into that. Thank you. Um, and I see some good comments on I think so. Where are we now? Um, yeah. Um, so Navis and um, poems about my munition lass try to rewrite a standard narrative about um, badly behaved workers into a narrative about respectable, lovable, entertaining, and often literate workers. The other thing that I find very interesting in workplace magazines, and that's very marked in these magazines, is because their primary audience is their own community, they can use kinds of professional language um, and kinds of um, workplace slang and jokes um, insider knowledge that you don't get when people write a poem and send it to the Annandale Observer because nobody would understand it who's reading the Annandale Observer. Um, so you get lovely poems that have these little bits of detail. Um, you'll have to ask Judith about what all the detail means because at the minute I'm just looking at the fact that it's there. Um, detail about what people are actually doing on the floor. And this, as you can see, is also um, a great poem because it's a slightly product version of Roger Kipling's extraordinarily famous inspirational poem, If, um, which pretty much from the time it was published became um, one of the most uh, quoted and indeed parodied poems in the English language. If you can carry on through all the hot days and never rest a moment from your work, if you can weigh and never care just what ways the balance chooses its wee bit to shirk, if you can fill its each tiny little minute with millions of titrations and speeches, then you will truly be the bally limit and we will give you crowds of laurel trees. So you will earn your laurels, not through poetry, but through managing to um, fill each minute. That's a direct quote from Kipling um, with a 60 seconds worth of distance run, I think it is in Kipling. Um, with millions of titrations. I like that millions is in capital letters in the original because one of these, what these kind of poems and these uh, working commentaries tend to suggest is that expectations are wildly unrealistic um, for what the workers can achieve. Valley limit rather implies that as well, I think. Um, next slide. So these are just a couple more examples. Um, the Section Engineers, a wonderful poem by J.H. Gall. Um, the electrician's gone and broken our only quarter drill. The Cressel plant requires a flange. Flange, am I pronouncing that right? Engineers will have to tell me. The job is standing still. A grease is short, I fit our place, and so forth. And it's about, it's got this lovely detail about all the forms you have to fill in. Um, so again, it's using the medium of poetry to represent the job. And here, 
as someone who analyzes poetry, I'd probably want to say things about how fast this poem is running um, and how the actual rhythms of the verse um, help you to think about the lack of rest during this person's working day, where even when he's sitting down, the section engineer is filling in all these forms. Um, next slide. These two are my final example. Yeah, my favorite piece in all, both the magazines is a skit called An Irregular Occurrence. Um, and it's a two page um, drama by Leonard Clement, who seems to be a chemist. Um, and it's about an accident happening at the plant. Um, but in the two pages, they don't find out anything about the actual accident because they're so busy dealing with the bureaucracy associated with an accident having happened. Um, and you can see a little taster of that bureaucracy where in order to report that somebody's hurt, but they don't know who, where, or what, they have to ring the works manager, the DVO, the chief of police, fire brigade, assistant superintendent, chief nurse, supervisor, and the boiler house. Um, I put a little extract on the next slide, if we just go to that, Judith. Um, yes, perhaps I just enjoy this because I work in academia, which is all the same bureaucracy with um, acronyms and forms. Um, so they, they check a form and they say, right, this is all great, except I haven't got the person's name or their number nor the nature of the accident. I say, well, it doesn't matter, send it off at once. Did you phone the assistant DBO? They phone the assistant DBO. Then they find out it's the wrong form. This isn't an injury report, it's a minor repair form, um, which I think is probably a joke as well about workers being injured and machines being broken um, and the correspondence between um, those two things. Are you repairing a worker as if they were a machine or, um, you know, what are you doing with them? Access your form. First operative in tears. The timekeeper says he won't pay me off because he hasn't received a W-12. These W forms were clearly the object of great hatred. Um, a W-12, the RO must have given her a W-11 card instead of a W, and so it goes on. Um, so it's a beautiful parody of bureaucracy involved. Um, it's very funny, but the humor rests on the reader's understanding all the acronyms and recognizing themselves in the various people who are running around trying to sort out this accident um, without being able to do so. Um, I see I've been speaking for a while, so I'll end there for questions. But I, yeah, I just wanted to end by saying that this is why I think these workplace magazines are exciting because it's hard to get a sense of what it was actually like for the people working in these locations unless we happen to have recorded interviews. And even recorded interviews are very, very, different kind of medium. So this shows us the way in which workers thought about the work they were doing and also the way in which they wanted that work represented and commemorated in various forms of print. Um, thank you, sorry for all the enthusiasm about poetry. I do work on poetry, so um, I get excited when I see it. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. And I've really, um, I have read all of these poems and all of these bits, but it's amazing how when you look at it again, you look at it with different eyes or you hear someone else talking about it, you see so many different things and hear so many different things. So that so was absolutely fantastic, as well as the context, which my, my, I don't think I was at all aware. So I'm well, just going to have a quick question about, yeah. I'm just looking at a question about literate navvies producing their own magazine. Hmm, not that I am aware of, and I should say that literate navvies, yes, by the First World War, you would have had some literate navvies, um, but the literacy rates in navvies would have been much, much less than for other workers in the factory. So there's a whole week on navvies running next week on my Railway um, Future Learn course, and people always say to us, wow, these people are so fascinating. Can we have more? Can we have more of their writings? Can we have more? And we say, well, there, there's nothing. <laughs> there's actually nothing. We had to fill in a whole mini lecture at the museum in which Ollie just stands in the railway museum saying, here's the entire museum and here's the only thing we have relating to navvies, which is a gravestone commemorating all of them who were killed on the Settle Carlisle um, line. And that's it. There's nothing even that we know a navvy owned. Um, so, I can't tell you how much I would love to find a Navi magazine, but there probably wasn't. And even if there was, it, we wouldn't have it now. Navis are the most mobile body of people and an awful lot of them um, were immigrants from all over the place who came together to work on a giant project like this. Um, you know, had a whole kind of town sprang up. It was built and they all just disappeared off again. 
Yeah, we know of uh, a family who were all working in Dornoch in the East Riggs part of the factory, uh, and they're recorded as such. I think it's 1917, there's a big marriage. Um, and then they're all in Middlesbrough in 1921. Oh, um, so they're completely and they all intermarried and you know there's all sorts of different family connections um so it's absolutely amazing there's we've got one object or two objects in the museum that we think belong to navvies and it's a pair of boots and a billy cam that were found under someone's house in east Riggs when they did oh, an extension great. they found it under the house which would seem to date it um, and they seem to be of the period so I'm just going to quickly whiz through these questions. I know I'm going to go back to some that we've kind of already touched on. So um, Pat asked, do these scrapbooks contain many names? I think you're asking that about the ones that um, you were talking about generally, Kirsty. Moss Fan Farewell and Dornock Farewell do contain a lot of names, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, um, and also some addresses. Um, mostly it's names of the staff rather than, say, the labourers or the workers. Yeah. There's lots of big sort of static images of hundreds of people in rows and they're not generally named but some of the um, important people have quite substantial bits of information about them. Um, Ali's agreeing with me that it might be called out writing, I think it is, I never thought of that before and someone's pointed out S Patterson, Australian Imperial Force and Royal Engineers cat badge at the top bottom. Oh, oh that's goodness. fascinating because there's lots of connections one of the things that frustrates me when I read these magazines, as I have done many times, is that I don't get the in-jokes, um, and I want to. I want to know what they're talking about. Um, but there is, an, a, a, in one of the magazines, I think it might be um, Moss Van Farewell, it mentions 20 REs, Royal Engineers, who arrived at the factory one mm -hmm. day, and no one exactly seemed to know what they were up to, and we still don't really. So that's very interesting that they merited <laughs> being on that magazine. So Peter says Susan should be in the post office records if she's a telegraphist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Pat, uh, the, yeah, that's the question you were just that's answering. Awesome. Yeah. Did some digitized? Abuse. No, the magazines aren't digitized, are they? Um, they're digitized in house at the museum. Um, yeah. So we do actually have Dornock Farewell, so I can send that to you, Kirsty, so you can have a look. Excellent. As a digital copy. Um, um, uh, but no, they haven't been shared digitally, but. Only within, uh, I think we've got currently got a research project going on, and I recognise a couple of names here of people being involved in it. So they've been shared with some of the research volunteers um, who are trying to find out as much as possible about the 30,000 workers at HM Factory Gretna. Um, the Annandale Observer, also you mentioned, hasn't been digitised, but we do actually have copies of it from uh, most of the war, World War One years. So that is a project we'd like to work on to get it digitised as well. It is on my profiche only at the Ewart Library in Dumfries, I believe. Um, so Claudia says the poems often mention click. Oh, sorry, thank you. Uh, the poems often mention click or clicking. Do you know what this means? It would no. depend on the poem. Um, yeah. I, I'm not sure if it's in one of the ones I showed. Um, oh yeah, actually I think what you're thinking of is, so this is in the um, Madeline Bedford's poem has a reference to this mm. um, and I think it's about it's courting if you go out and you click with someone is that what, what the, you might be thinking about you know you hit it off it means um, so in her poem there's, it definitely says a couple of the poems about women workers it says that it says and in that 10 little Dornick girls poem which is the one that's been most anthologized it says 10 little Dornick girls one of them went out and clicked went out yeah yeah. And clicked and yeah. yeah. So yeah, it means you know you you hit it off with someone. You got together. Mm. But it, I, I guess it could also be kind of a pun. Magazine, I assume it, but yeah. I guess it could also be kind of a pun, like a bit like it's a, a, a sort of the clicks and sounds of the machinery and you click sort of thing. It's yeah, like, there's a lot yeah. of telegraph clicks and so forth yeah. happening in industrial poems at this time. I think oh, you find it. Oh, Sarah, sorry. Hello, Sarah. The Marsburn Farewell is digitised, oh, thank you, on Imperial War Museum's Women's Work Collection and some academic libraries. Yeah, I did see a reference to that. Unfortunately, I couldn't access it in that format. I do like to see hard copy things where I can because it gives you a sense of the size and the format. But mm. yeah, the War Museum's got, um, I think, quite a lot of relevant yeah, things. It's got an yeah, local thing well. for getting a date. Yeah, thank you, Kirsty, yeah, for confirming that. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, another comment on the cat badges. Yeah. 
did they change with different issues? Well, that's that image that I showed you is the only such cover image, I think. Is that right, Judith? Yes, it is. Um, so or... that issue of was there a magazine? Um, because I, I think mm -hmm. there is a reference in Dornock or Moss Band Farewell, and I can't remember which one, but uh, that they had tried to start a magazine but failed. Um, I Ooh. think there's some sort of reference to three years later and at last we've got it going or something like that, that um, I, 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 I'm not aware of there having been a, a regular magazine uh, within the factory, which is quite surprising really, but maybe with the wartime emergencies and things like that, I don't know, maybe they were just too prior prioritizing other things, I don't know, or, or yeah. they maybe tried and there just wasn't the interest uh, and they saved it all up to these bumper editions at the end when people were feeling nostalgic because it was all ending. I don't know. But it's uh, interesting. No I mean, it's interesting that clearly a few people were writing poems and some of them may have been the workers and sending them out to the local papers, which was mm. not at all unusual. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've certainly, um, uh, uh, lots of them seem to have been writing sort of their own autobiographies as well. Um, and we've had a few of those shared with us. Um, so quite recently, um, W.G. Emmett, uh, who you mentioned in there as someone who'd written something at the beginning, his uh, great nephew, I think it was, donated his copy of Moss Band Farewell um, to the museum, which was an amazing thing to actually get a copy that was owned by someone who's named mm -hmm. in it. Um, and then that they, he also has then given us copies of his uh, autobiography from the time as well. So he's obviously writing quite a lot. Um, so that's quite interesting too that they, you know that they were writing their own documents. And there's a there's a one a bit in one of them about. Um, memories of coming over from the front and that I'm pretty sure that's written by someone who wrote a substantial diary of their time which is now in the Leeds uh, Liddell archive mm. um, Jeffrey Higson who was a diarist um, and also a member of the Royal Engineers so let's see what else these comments so are so asking about I have Kirsty yes um, actually it's my colleague on the project Mike Sanders at Manchester um, who's been to Oldham and read the entire Sam Fitton archive and is um, very, very enthused. Um, but yes, we're working on the Cotton Factory Times, the Yorkshire Factory Times, Teddy Ashton's journal. They're amazing sources for us. And actually, if you're a Sam Fitton fan and you go on our website in the Songs from the Mills section, um, you can see Jennifer Reid, who is a Lancashire um, ballad performer and clog dancer. Um, reciting and singing some of Fitton's songs for us. Um, that relates to the question um, from Pat Adamson about folk songs as well. Yeah. And uh, the one about clogs. Yeah, and the one about clogs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Jennifer says that the clog dances, um, you were supposed to be able to recognise the different kinds of mills from the different dances. I don't know, you'd have to ask her. She's a clog dancing expert. Um, and she sees those dances in the rhythm of our poems as well. So it's so it's not all that likely that any of the poems in these magazines became songs, so to speak. But what is very likely is that a lot of these poems are written so that if it was 1919, you would look at the poem and you would hear the tune that you knew it was set to that we've now forgotten. So one of the most important things we've done in this project is worked with these local musicians in Scotland and um, with Jennifer, because they can look at a poem and they'll just say straight off, oh yeah, it's this tune. And I'll be like, this is why you're here because I don't know that. But, but you know, the person who wrote that and everybody who read it did know that because they all just had that bank um, of folk tunes in their head. So a lot of the poems in these magazines would have been intended to be sung not the ones that are very kind of Longfellow and Kipling, um, slightly kind of fancier literary poems, but um, the ones like that Scots one, you could, in fact, I think you probably could sing that to a standard Burns tune, because we've got two other Factory Girl poems very similar that fit that tune. Um, so yeah, you could have you could have gone and sung them down the pub. You probably have been singing ruder songs than the ones that made it into the magazine, to be honest. But did workers make up their own songs about the management? Um, and sing them on the factory floor. Yes, they did. They haven't survived. Um, we know because we have people talking about it. For instance, that in Dundee, all those jute woman factory workers had a whole load of what are always called scurrilous songs that they sang, and not one of those songs exists. Um, I had a PhD student who spent four years trying to find some, and they weren't. Mm -hmm. She found a lot of other good stuff, but no. 
Um, it's always the way it's like you say it's like who wouldn't love to find out you know the, the secret life of a navi the, an authenticated thing but it just never quite comes to pass does it it's the things we don't know that you know the things no one cared to ask or the names no one wrote down or the people that were deemed unimportant or didn't write down something or yeah it's all of the mystery it just makes it so uh, frustrating for a researcher but mysterious and interesting for the bystander so did anyone else have any other questions we've had quite a good uh, good few I was going to ask you what your favourite poem of all the ones you've discovered is it doesn't have to be to do with Moss Van Farewell obviously or is it too difficult a question all the ones I've discovered it's yeah it's quite a difficult question actually um, you know the poet Kathleen Jamie emailed me the other day she said I'm doing an anthology Kirsty I need one Victorian workers poem I was like I just can't answer that question Kathleen I've got 4,000 <laughs> yeah it's probably a different one every day as well I imagine um actually I think my favorite my favorite poem no I do have a favorite poem um and it's in the mill workers anthology on our website it's um by Johnny Hall in um the borders and it's called a farewell address to my machine um in separate mills the machine was called Wallace and it's a little manuscript poem, but I just love it that his machine was named and it's about how he's becoming old and obsolete and the machine was becoming old and obsolete. Um, and when my researcher was looking at that for me and she sent me a photo through, I was that was when I was just writing this grant bid for this project. And I was like, this is it. This is what we're going to find. Um, and this is really amazing stuff. Um, and we have found really amazing stuff and we can't wait to get back into the archives. We haven't visited yet. And, um, find more no one knew all these workers writings existed and they do exist yeah. it's wonderful what you're doing bringing them all together and bringing them to light i think it's fantastic i think yeah. one of the difficulties with lockdown has been everybody saying oh well you can do your research online you can do stuff online it's like well if the point is we're trying to find stuff that's not online that's not been accessed that's not been digitized you need to get in there and have a good rummage round and see what you can find so yeah it's great that you're doing it Places don't know what they've got until we don't know what places have got. We have to physically look through. I mean, I'm cataloging the Mitchell Library Scottish Poetry Collection. There are about mm -hmm. thousands of books. We have to physically look at every one to see what it was and who it was by. And mm -hmm. for me, where are they an industrial worker? So we find gold there, but you can't do it without actually seeing the seeing the books. Do the poems, are there critical poems that have survived? Far fewer, like I was saying, because if you are a worker, everything that you get into print is mediated. It's mediated by a newspaper editor, it's mediated by these magazine editors, you know, and also what you write is shaped by your awareness of what's gonna get published. You know, maybe you did write a poem about how utterly miserable your life in the munitions factory was. No local paper would have printed that during the First World War, they just wouldn't have. Um, and certainly the magazine wouldn't have printed it. So we do have, Critical poems, where you tend to see them is in the workers' newspapers run by the Independent Labour Party, the Socialist Parties and the trade unions. Um, so that's where you find, you know, poems that are really negative about the experience of being a worker and about the masters and the bosses. I tell you where you find the most critical stuff in the, in the Devil's Forage Museum, the, the document. Because I have often thought that the Moss Band Farewell, Dawn at Farewell, they're very, very patriotic and enthusiastic. Uh, and you sort of think it's very different to the view of the war that you get from a lot of other poetry. Um, but in the, we have a collection of autograph books in the uh, Devil's Porridge Museum that were written by, mostly by the young women at the time. And there's a couple that really stand out to me. And I, I use this example quite a lot. So apologies if anyone's heard it before. But it says um, it's written in a girl's handwriting, and I think it says at the bottom that she lived in Bodicea House or Boudica House, which is just perfect as well. And it says, uh, "God made the bees, the bees made the honey, the Gretna girls have done the work, and the chemists took all the money." Which <laughs> I just brilliant. thought was quite perfect. Um, and there's another one that says something about if only those who caused this war were the only ones who fought it, a better world than this be tonight than those going to sleep crying or whatever it is and I also that's quite a critical one about the sort of people who drag people the ordinary folk into war uh, and aren't the ones who do the suffering so there's, yeah. there's a few in there but they're generally quite um 
enthusiastic or light in tone, I guess. They do emphasise, though, quite a few of them, workplace accidents and disasters. There aren't, but kind of in a light way. Mm. But when you read yeah. through them, there's quite a bit. You know, like when they're making a joke, and one of the ones I showed about um, breathing in the fumes or whatever. So they mention these things in passing. But, yeah. you know, they do all add up to a sense of the dangerous inherent mm. in that work. Yeah. It would be great to try and find out what those W1 forms and things were, wouldn't it? From from our point of view, we would love. To, I'm sure we would all love to know what those were and where they are, in what archive or in what filing cabinet or somewhere. It would be amazing to find those, to find the records of because uh, all that bureaucracy that they had, which we've now lost, would be fantastic from us, for our perspective, to put it all back together and piece together what they were up to, you know. So. Okay, um, we've got, oh yeah, we've got lots of nice, uh, is, if anyone else has got any comments or questions, please do speak up now or pop your comment in the chat. Um, where do we yes. find um, oh, I've got a comment. Mm -hmm. Who's this? Yeah, hello. Hello. Um, these um, W11, W12, they sound like standard forms. Yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure I remember W11 from when I was working. Yeah. Well, I was going to say I'm sure they're still W11s. So are they kind of just forms that emerged in the workplace in the 20th century, or are they specific? I mean, there's a lot of specific stuff in the poems that you think this must be, relate to the munitions factory, and then I think there's more stuff that's about wartime bureaucracy, and then I think there's stuff that's just about your standard large workplace bureaucracy. So detangling all of that and working out how it all fit together would, as Judith was saying, be really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's a reference in one of the poems to something large that spins and is freezing cold, um, like some large piece of industry. And I was thinking, now what is that? And what part of the process is that in? Um, you know, it's just, you know, you could just puzzle yourself over it and look at all the pictures and try and put it back together. Um, so. Oh, every military form has a number except toilet paper. Thank you, Robin, for that one. Although we do have some military issue or whatever it is, government property toilet paper in the museum collection. It says property of the government on each on each piece. So, um, sorry, um, Pat, you're asking... It doesn't have a number. It doesn't have a number, no. though. General theory, it belongs to the government. Uh, Kirsty, where do we find your talk? You said started soon. Um, oh, is that the one you were talking about, the Future Museum one? I think that's the Future Learn platform. So I'm just putting this in the chat so we all have it. Um, yeah, we are on Facebook as well. We always forget. So if you just, if you want to join the Working Lives courses, which I highly recommend, you would not believe the, are getting 1,500 comments a week on the Railways course. Oh, uh, that's not me. That's all the learners chatting to each other very excitedly about railway heritage. So if you're a railway enthusiast, you want to get in there and um, start debating the life of the navvies. Um, and the factories and mills, which is probably our most popular one, we always get a um, really fantastic group of learners doing those. So those are free. You just go to Future Learn. Um, and if you haven't used it before, I think you have to create a free account. Just search for Working Lives and you'll see them all coming up. Um, Twitter and our website has information about our online reading groups that we do in Zoom every other Tuesday. The next set are starting in a couple of weeks. But if you want to, you know, animatedly discuss workers' writings, everybody's welcome at those. Um, they're quite lively as well. We always think they'll last for, you know, 40 minutes and an hour and a half later, everybody's still, still going. Excellent. Kirsty, yeah. Go ahead, Robin, sorry. Sorry, I was just going to say to Kirsty that the um, the factory was serviced by railway, and it was a, an internal railway line that worked around the factory. So you may find links there as well. Yeah, no, I did think I saw some um, material on that, um, and actually, Ollie at the railway museum said he thought he might have some interesting stuff, but he just had a baby, so I haven't bothered him with it for this talk. <laughs> He's not awake enough, but. Um, I'll check up with them. Yeah, because the, the intersection of these industries is a real interest to us, the ways in which they all come together and rely on each other. People keep asking us for a course on the, the railways in wartime, actually, but I'm so far from being an expert on that that I'd have to leave it to someone else. Oh, we're having a t on, in our conference on May the 20th, 21st, there's a talk on the, the rail, well, two actually, 
from Becky uh, Pe Peacock at the R Scottish Railway Museum. She's delivering a talk on Scottish women on the railways. Oh, great. Also having one on women in the northeast on the railways as well. So um, that should be amazing. Actually, this, it's the gentleman who's doing that's already sent through some fantastic photographs. So it should be a very interesting talk um, in the sort of Ashington area as well. So it should be good. Yeah. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, it's not an area that I, I feel like I've explored fully either, the railways in the factory. Uh, I've got, read that lots of different references to it. Um, some of the jobs sounded quite definitely very, very unpleasant that they did on the railways. Um, but yeah, it's a whole other area to explore. Um, so it seems like everyone's had a good chance to ask their questions and it's been a really interesting evening uh, from my perspective and it seems like everyone else has been really stimulated as well. And the future learn stuff seems like definitely worth something I'll be very interested in following up myself. So that's brilliant. So thank you very much, Kirsty, on behalf of everyone in the audience and on behalf of the Devil's Porridge Museum, we really appreciate you delivering this really amazing talk and we hope to see you at the museum again sometime soon. Or I hope so. Thanks soon. very much for coming. Um, thank you for your great yeah. questions and comments. Yeah. <laughs> great. So I'll, I'll give you a round of applause. And uh, let, there are lots of people saying thank you. That's excellent. Yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Um, it was a very interesting talk. So thank you so much.